Okay, welcome uh, to the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. I am Professor and Associate Dean for Graduate Studies, Jim Neff, and I'm welcoming, welcoming you to our Graduate Studies Lecture Series. Tonight we have one of our faculty members and a graduate of this law school, Fran Quigley, um, talking about his experiences with human rights in in Haiti. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors who are listed in the program who have supported the series and have encouraged people to attend. There are too many to mention by name. I'd also like to thank uh, Perfecto Caparis who um, works with me here at the law school and who led the effort to organize this lecture series and tonight's event in particular. Um, tonight's lecture concerns human rights in Haiti and we are celebrating or commemorating Human Rights Day which is officially on December 10th but December 10th invariably lands right in the middle of our exam period so we often try to do something a little bit ahead of time. Um, Human Rights Day is December 10th that's the day on which the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now not every document that the UN promulgates has much influence in the world, but this one did. Um, and many countries um, over the next 40 or 50 years use that declaration as the basis for either arguing for human rights in their countries or bringing human rights violators to justice. We're also celebrating um, tonight the international community at our law school here at Indiana University. Um, uh, as you entered the atrium, you saw all of those flags up in the atrium. They are not there just for decoration. They indicate the home countries of our international students at the law school. And as you can see, there are many of them, and they represent JD students, LLM students, and our doctoral students in the SJD program as well. Also, I'd like to uh, remind everyone of all of the, or at least some of the international programs that we have here at the law school in Indianapolis. Uh, we have a very vibrant and highly successful summer program in Beijing, China, um, run by Professor Tom Wilson, who also heads up the Joint Center for Asian Law Studies in association with Renmin University in Beijing. Uh, Professor Emmert heads up the International and Comparative Law Center here at the law school, which is engaged in many activities, including um, running an LLM program that we deliver in Cairo every year. In fact, Professor Emmert is in Cairo at the moment, and if things remain relatively stable, I hope to go there to give some lectures in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, Professor Quigley runs a Health and Human Rights Center here at the law school, which he may have something to talk about. Um, we have a program in international human rights that Professor Edwards heads up. And of course, we have many student organizations. I see a lot of students in the room that many of those organizations focus on international matters. And we have International and Comparative Law Review. We have an international moot court team. And students are invited to get involved in as many of those activities as they can. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome everyone here and thank you all for attending. Remind you that we will have some refreshments out in the atrium at the conclusion of the lecture tonight. And to introduce our speaker, I'm going to turn the podium over to Professor and Associate Dean for International Affairs, Karen Bravo. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to the law school and to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Quigley, the director of the school's Health and Human Rights Clinic, also the founder of that clinic. Professor Quigley has extensive experience in the practical engagement in international human rights issues, both in the United States and internationally. His most recent book, Victory for the People, How Human Rights Can Save Haiti, addresses some of the issues that he will discuss with us today. What can we do practically with respect to Haiti? 
Uh, however, that book was preceded by his book on Kenya, on um, the Indiana University Medical School's partnership with Moi University's medical school in Kenya. That is a successful anti-AIDS partnership, which is central to the internationalization of the IUPUI campus. Indeed, uh, Professor Quigley was instrumental in the creation of the LACE program in which the law school is involved. That is the Legal Aid Center of Eldoret, through which legal aid is rendered to AIDS widows and others in Kenya, those who are suffering not just the medical effects of AIDS, but the psychological and social effects, as well as the legal uh, detriments that come with that status in Kenya. Um, he has engaged in human rights advocacy on the ground, both here in the U.S. and internationally, as I said, so a quintessential, quintessential practitioner scholar who exemplifies to our students the ability to meld both theoretical perspectives as well as practical engagement in international law. It therefore is my pleasure to introduce him to you as he will tell us not just about saving Haiti, not as saviors, outsiders, but what Haiti can do to save itself. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Bravo. Thank you, Dean Neff. And, and thank you to all the sponsors today. Before I begin, though, I'd like to um, build on something that Professor Neff, uh, Dean Neff already referenced, and that is today, the organizer of today's event um, is also has also been the organizer of so many different human rights activities in this community and has been a strong voice for human rights um, within our law school institution, on our campus, in our community, and globally. And first in his work with our wonderful program in international human rights law, led by Professor Edwards, and now in his work with our wonderful LLM program, led by Dean Neff. And Perfecto Caparis, can you, um, where did Perfecto go? I want to give him a... <laughs> He walked out a few minutes ago. Okay. When he comes back in, we'll have to give him a spontaneous round of applause, right? So even though he's not here, he'll watch the tape. Let's give uh, Perfecto a round of applause to appreciate it. <laughs> On International Human Rights Day 2012, before we look forward, before we even talk about the present, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes thinking about the past. As Dean Neff stated, uh, today is, or actually the date of International Human Rights Day in a few days, is the date we recognize the Universal Declaration of Human Rights passing. And really when you think about it, the international human rights revolution that began in uh, the mid-20th century at least, depending on how you uh, calculate it, um, has reached an important critical point today in history. So it's worth thinking about how we would have responded in other at other critical times in human rights history. So think about to yourself, what would you have done if it was 1934 and Mohandas Gandhi came to you and said, we are engaged in a struggle to overcome colonialism, to achieve self-determination for all people around the world. We face enormous challenges. There are a lot of barriers, there's a lot of resistance. We could use your help. How would you respond? What if it was 1954 and Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King came to you and said, we are engaged in a struggle to overcome institutional racism in the American South. We are faced with institutional resistance. We are faced with legal and political and violent resistance. But this is an important human rights struggle. We could use your help. What if it was 1984? And Nelson Mandela wrote to you from his cell in Robben Island and said, we are engaged in the effort to overcome apartheid, institutionalized racism in South Africa. We are faced with enormous resistance, globally and locally, and we could use your help. How would you respond? And I think these are important questions to ask ourselves because we are at a similar moment today in international human rights history. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is now what we're coming up on 70 years old. The human rights revolution is complete, at least on paper, because we have plenty of declarations that promise all kinds of rights to all kind, every person in the, in the world. We have constitutions, we have treaties, we have declarations. There's plenty of signing ceremonies and photo ops. On paper, the international human rights revolution is done. But for the poorest of the poor in the world, 
those guarantees on paper are not yet reality. Which brings us to Haiti. As law professors and lawyers and law students, and, and I see a fair number of you sprinkled uh, among our group today, I think we can far too often, when we talk about human rights, start discussing the second part of that phrase before we talk about the first part of the phrase. We start talking about those constitutions and the treaties and the declarations and those wonderful abstract rights and maybe even abstract data showing whether the rights are, are uh, being upheld or not. But I want to focus for a minute on the humans, and I want to introduce you to three people that I've had the privilege to meet in Haiti in recent months. Now, the first is this young woman in the middle, uh, Marguerite, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I took this photograph of Marguerite um, outside her home. Sweet, sweet young uh, little girl, as you can see. But unfortunately, Marguerite's home is a piece of blue plastic that is spread out of a tear in it, spread out over some rotting boards, um, on one side of this kind of sh shack tent that she lives in with her family is a kind of a dirty blanket. It's actually a Disney Aladdin blanket, which has clearly been discarded from some other richer part of the world. On the other side, another piece of cardboard and piece of plastic. And she lives in an internally displaced persons camp in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, what you can see here, her front porch is essentially this dirt which turns into a mud bog whenever it rains. What you can't see in this photograph is that this, uh, Marguerite and her family uh, live next to, uh, crammed next to thousands of other people in a small lot in the middle of Port-au-Prince where they have been living since the earthquake of January 2010. What you can't see in the photograph as well, unfortunately, uh, for our understanding, is the stench. Uh, because right behind the tent, the shack where Marguerite lives, is a small, is a kind of a narrow ditch with this gray water and essentially what I learned is that that's the sewer, that's the toilet, because there's no working toilet, there's no running water in this place where thousands and thousands of Haitians are living, including Marguerite. That's the first person I want to introduce you to. The second person I want to introduce you to is Myrta Jean-Baptiste. I don't have a photograph of Myrta Jean-Baptiste. I talked with her, but she was scared to get her photograph taken. So I decided I'd put up a photograph of the person that makes her scared. And the person is Jean-Claude Duvalier. Jean-Claude Duvalier, uh, his army and his police arrested Myrta John Baptiste for the first time when she was 13 years old. And the police and the army arrested every single member of her family. And when they did so, they arrested the family on the charge of the fact they actually belonged to a political party. They dared to belong to a political party that challenged the unquestioned rule of Jean-Claude Duvalier. Myrta John Baptiste was released and she survived, but two of her brothers did not. While in prison, they were beaten, they were tortured, they were starved, they were not given medical care. And within a few weeks, a few weeks after being released, they both died. The third person I want to introduce you to is St. Clair Vincent on the, on the far, on your left. Oh, you're right, excuse me. Um, and St. Clair Vincent I met in the village of Rivier Canoe, Haiti. And she told me about the day in October 2010 when her mother, who had been in perfect health, all of a sudden came down with massive painful stomach cramps, and then had vomiting, and then had diarrhea, and was so ill that St. Clair Vincent and her family knew that they had to act quickly, and they rushed her as quickly as they could to the next town, which had a little hospital. But they were too late, and St. Clair Vincent's mother died right in front of her, and it turned out she died of cholera. And it also turned out that other people were rushing to the same hospital at the same time because cholera had just had this massive outbreak in rural Haiti that physicians later described as like a bomb going off. And the healthcare workers were so panicky that they were, and they knew they were dealing with an infectious disease that they insisted on taking St. Clair Vincent's mother's body and throwing her into a pit, along with other folks who died in that hospital that evening. And the reason I talk to you about these three folks is that these three folks, these individual humans, represent the broader rights problem in Haiti. Myrta Jean Baptiste, excuse me, uh, Marguerite is one of 300,000 people in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, who are still homeless almost three years after the January 2010 earthquake. A murder Jean Baptiste is one of thousands of people who have who felt the effect of Jean-Claude Duvalier's oppression. And one of millions of Haitians, really every Haitian, who felt the effect of Jean-Claude Duvalier and his family stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from an already impoverished country's treasury. Yet Jean-Claude Duvalier is back in Haiti and walks the streets a free man, which is why murder Jean Baptiste's picture's not up here. She's scared. And St. Clair Vincent's mother 
And her tragic death was unfortunately not the only one from cholera in October of 2010 in Haiti. There have been a total of 7,400 people killed from cholera. A really a 19th century disease. You don't hear of people dying in Indianapolis, Indiana from cholera in October and in the fall of 2010. And 600,000 people in Haiti sickened with cholera. Over half a million people. So I appreciate you all coming out to hear a talk about Haiti because I think it's very fair to have Haiti fatigue. I think it's very fair in the human rights world to have even Haiti despair because you think, are we hearing about Haiti again? Um, haven't we already taken care of it? Haven't we taken action? And for most of you in this room, I guess I'm thinking the answer to that is yes. After the January 2010 earthquake, where hundreds of thousands of people were killed, millions of people left homeless, the world community responded, responded generously. $10 billion in assistance has been pledged to Haiti post-earthquake uh, by governments, by individuals. In fact, in the United States, one out of every two U.S. households actually gave money to Haiti through efforts like this kind of telethon, text message campaigns, uh, Facebook campaigns, etc. Yet, almost three years after the earthquake, Marguerite still lives in dirt, still doesn't have running water, still doesn't have a toilet. So what's the problem here? Why hasn't Haiti improved? And the answer to that question is why we're here today, because Haiti has not improved because Haiti does not have access to human rights for its poor people. Haiti does not have an established rule of law. Haiti has wonderful laws on the books, in the Constitution, and in the statutes. They've, been, uh, they've signed on to most of the major human, almost all the major human rights treaties. So on paper, the law exists. In reality, for the poor especially, not so much. So the thesis today is that human rights and the rule of law are the absolute core of what it takes for a country like Haiti and other developing countries to build up into a functioning, fair, just society. So the metaphor I have here depicted in the PowerPoint is, is that when you do spend billions of dollars in assistance and send it to a country like Haiti, that's wonderful. But what you're essentially doing is you're trying to build a structure without a foundation. You're putting up wonderful drywall, you're painting, you are maybe even doing some landscaping, um, you're putting up ornate pillars, but you haven't built the foundation yet, you haven't built sturdy framing yet, and as a result, when that structure is challenged, it's going to crumble. And the picture here, unfortunately, is met the metaphor come true in Haiti. When January of 2010, the earthquake caused 27 of the 28 major government buildings to crumble, killing tens of thousands of government workers. This is Haiti's National Palace. This is Haiti's White House, which completely was destroyed in the earthquake. Now, I think it's easy for me to stand up here as a law professor and a lawyer and talk about that human rights and the rule of law are the very core of what it takes for a country to recover and for a country to prosper. And um, so I understand that, and it's bias. Uh, I, as uh, Dean Neff and uh, Dean Bravo mentioned, I actually work in a clinic that has the, the term human rights in it. Why wouldn't I think it's important? So what I'll do what lawyers do, right? Don't, don't take my word for it when I argue to the jury, right? Take the witness's words. Let's call some expert witnesses from other fields. The first expert witness on your left is Dr. Paul Farmer. And Paul Farmer, if you know anything about Haiti, you know anything about global development, you recognize the name. Paul Farmer is a Harvard Medical School physician, Harvard Medical School professor, and anthropologist, has written multiple books on Haiti, been the subject of a best-selling book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, and founded the organization Partners in Health. And the organization Partners in Health has done so much wonderful work in Haiti. And when folks think about what a country like Haiti needs, I think too often we think, this is what Haiti needs. Haiti needs a wonderful physici uh, physician. Haiti needs nurses. Maybe you think Haiti needs engineers to build new roads or construction workers to build new houses. And all of that is true. But until the rule of law is in place, until human rights are respected, it's not going to work. And my witness is Dr. Paul Farmer himself, who says that until the poor have access to justice, that is the core of all the problems in Haiti the poor's lack of access to justice. It's the reason for the corruption, it's the reason for the poverty, it's the reason for the dysfunction in the country. And Paul Farmer has put his actions where his words are. He is a founding board member of an organization called the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, Haiti's le leading human rights organization. I'm going to spend a little time talking about later. Our next set of expert witnesses are going to be economists. We've had the medical uh, expert witness, so let's diversify with some economists. Uh, you've probably heard the, the name of Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate economist, 
who himself survived a famine in Bengal in 1942. And what Amartya Sen studied when he reached maturity and, and, uh, and gained his academic chops is he started to, under, to study what causes a famine. What causes the kind of deep, enduring poverty that you see that, that in places like Haiti? And he found out that it's not a meteorological phenomenon. It's not an agricultural phenomenon. It's a political phenomenon. A famine has never occurred, Sen discovered, in a country that has a democracy and a free press. Because a famine happens when the poorest of the poor cannot get their voices heard, cannot be understood, cannot have their cries answered by their leaders, because their leaders are not accountable to them. Other economists, the development economists, agree. Um, Darren Osamoglu, you may recognize that name from MIT, uh, Hernando de Soto. They talk about the rule of law, the fact that, that you need to actually, for an individual in a poor country, you need to have title to land, enforceable title to land in order to build, in order to um, create wealth, in order to, to employ people and support your family. And in fact, uh, the picture in the middle uh, references um, an anecdote from an article about Darren Osamoglu, the MIT economist. And the anecdote comes from Haitian farmers. And these are Haitian mango farmers were, um, the reporter was in rural Haiti and saw these uh, Haitian farmers who had, um, on each parcel, parcel of land that they had, they had three or four mango trees. And the mango trees were doing great. And in fact, that there was uh, water nearby that they could use for irrigation. And uh, the question was, you got extra land, why instead of three or four mango trees don't you have two dozen or three dozen? You could support your family, you could hire some people, you could sell the, the extras in the market. And the Haitian farmers looked at the visiting reporter and they shook their, his head, they shook their heads. They said, you don't understand Haiti. We can get away with having three or four mango trees and barely scrape by. But if we dare to have two dozen or three dozen mango trees, somebody with more power than us somebody with more guns than us, somebody who's more connected to the corrupt government is going to come take it from us. And they're going to use some kind of title that they got from some kind of government ent entity, and they're going to take this from us. Because we don't have the rule of law in Haiti. Uh, the last set of expert witnesses I'll call, I'll call some philosophers. For, I see law students here, so we're, we're stretching the rules of evidence to call these philosophers after they're long dead, but we'll say that they're dying declarations maybe. That'll be our, evident, our hearsay exception. Um, Plato, all the way up to Plato. Plato wanted philosopher kings, right? But recognized that was not very feasible, so he talked about the necess necessity of government of laws and not men. Thomas Aquinas, John Locke, talking about when law ends, tyranny begins. This isn't really a very controversial point historically or philosophically or economically. The rule of law, recognition and enforcement of human rights for the poorest of the poor, for all people, is necessary for a country to prosper. And when it's not there, it's the reason why the country can't recover. And unfortunately, that's the story in Haiti. To describe Haiti today, I think it's uh, useful to use the term that uh, Paul Farmer and other physicians with Partners in Health use, and they borrow it from the medical lexicon, obviously, acute on chronic, in that Haiti has acute problems caused by natural disasters of earthquakes or tropical storms or hurricanes, but they're layered on top of this chronic disease of poverty, of corruption, of suffering in Haiti. Um, before January 12th of 2010, Haiti already was the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Haiti already had 80% unemployment. Uh, children in Haiti weren't able to all go to school. Uh, there wasn't ad adequate access to health care. There was massive deforestation. Before January 2010, Haiti was a human rights rule of law disaster story. Uh, the picture in the middle here, the gentleman on your left, is Papa Doc Duvalier, Jean-Claude Duvalier's father, um, Francois Duvalier, one of the most brutal, vicious, thieving dictators in modern history. And he ruled Haiti and stole every nickel that he could and uh, beat and killed and intimidated any possible uh, uh, resistance. And Haiti has had, he's in a symptom of a broader chronic problem. Haiti has had 32 coup d'etat in its 200 year history, 23 different constitutions. Um, and unfortunately, Francois Duvalier, uh, Papa Doc Duvalier, is a symptom of some of the problems of, of foreign intervention in Haiti. The Duvaliers were backed up by our government, the United States of America, uh, financially and militarily. When the Duvaliers were finally kicked out of Haiti, 
uh, than the United uh, and Democratic elections occurred for the first time in Haiti's history. Um, both times, the president was overthrown by m paramilitary thugs, military thugs. Uh, that unfortunately their support was traced back to the CIA in the United States. So the in foreign intervention in Haiti has also contributed to this chronic problem. And then finally, the picture of the shacks on the hillside. Port-au-Prince, um, uh, and I think there's some folks in this room have been to Port-au-Prince many times. Port-au-Prince has many hillsides, and on the hillsides, the poor people who have come into Port-au-Prince trying to find some kind of work, some kind of support, have built little shacks on the side of the, on the hills. And Haiti does not have enforced zoning codes. Haiti does not have enforced building codes. Haiti did not have um, an emergency response system. And this was the situation before January 12, 2010, when the earthquake happened. And unfortunately, these are the kind of shacks that literally tumbled down on people, killing thousands and thousands. The chronic situation we explain. The acute problem, we talked about the January 12, 2010 uh, earthquake. But also, Haiti suffers from uh, when you, I think we see this on CNN or you read about it in the New York Times or whatever, and you see, wow, there's been another earthquake in Haiti. There's been another tropical storm in Haiti. This picture on your left, if I can get my directions right here, your left is, unfortunately, this is what a road turns into after a tropical storm comes down in Haiti. Um, Hurricane Sandy killed dozens and dozens and dozens of people in Haiti. Massive deforestation there means that nothing is going to keep uh, entire mountainsides from flowing down. Uh, dirt roads that are not, uh, that are not in any way drained leads to enormous danger for the people of Haiti. This is the acute problem on top of the chronic problem. So it's tempting to look at Haiti and you hear about the latest natural disaster there and say, well, you know, this is horrible. Haiti's so unlucky. It's luck doesn't have anything to do with it. These are unnatural disasters because Haiti is not ready to withstand these disasters. Good example, we know about the horrible earthquake damage in Haiti in January 2010. What you may not have remembered is just a few weeks later, the country of Chile had an earthquake that was many times stronger. It was many times stronger, but had a fraction as much damage, a fraction as much physical damage, a fraction as much loss of life. And it was because Chile has the rule of law. Chile has rights that are respected for their people. So they have building codes. They have zoning codes. They have an emergency response system. Chile was ready to handle the natural disaster. Unfortunately, Haiti's not. And the core of the chronic problem for Haiti is the situation with the rule of law. The Creole phrase I have up here, and, and I think there's a few folks in this room, Brigitte and others can correct my pronunciation, but the, uh, the Constitution c'est papier, bayonet c'est fait. The Constitution is paper, but the bayonet is steel. Might makes right. Well-known phrase in Haiti, and unfortunately, the evidence uh, has carried that out, not just historically, but what we see today. In the lower left-hand photo here is a picture of a Haitian prison cell. I visited a Haitian prison a few weeks, uh, a few months ago, and they wouldn't let me take photographs there, so I found this picture online, which pretty much represented what I saw there. Dozens dozens of people stuck in what essentially is like the size of almost a parking space, living there 23 hours, 45 minutes a day. They were let out once a day to go to the bathroom. They had to bathe in there. They had to eat in there. They had to take turns sleeping because there wasn't enough space for everybody to sleep at the same time. So some people laid down while some people stood up. Uh, they were there for stealing a goat. They were there for getting in a fight. 90% of them, according to some surveys, never have seen a judge. That's justice for the poor in Haiti. The upper right-hand photograph is justice for the rich. The gentleman on your right is Jean-Claude Duvalier, back in Haiti, free man, and being welcomed warmly by the person in the middle who is the president of Haiti, Michel Martelly, who was elected in 2011 only after the most popular political party in the country was removed from the ballot. The gentleman over Michel Martelly's right shoulder, the young man there, is Jean-Claude Duvalier's son, one of President Martelly's top aides. Can you think of any other country in the world where someone who has been so widely understood to be a brutal, thieving dictator is back, not just walking the streets a free man, but welcomed and embraced by the president of the country? So what's to be done? It's important to bear witness to the suffering in Haiti. It's important to bear witness to the idea that it's so important to have human rights and the rule of law. As a, as a core component, as the foundation for Haiti's uh, recovery. But what can we do about it? Um, well, we can send aid to Haiti. And there's nothing wrong with that. Haitians are, are, are very uh, welcoming and appreciative of international aid coming there. 
But again, unless we do this in a much smarter way, we're not going to have better results. Um, in fact, we have sent aid, the United States, uh, the UN, the World Bank has sent aid to Haiti specifically focused on the rule of law, um, recognizing this core concept that we have to have human rights in place before a country can recover. And that money has been sent, spent on building courthouses, training judges, training prosecutors, etc. cetera. Uh, UN, many folks in this room may know, UN and World Bank and USAID, they do a great job of coming back later and writing a report about what happened. They came back later, five years later, and they find the courthouses that are built were abandoned. Nobody was working in them. Poor people still stuck in prison, never going to court. Judges still either corrupt or the ones who weren't corrupt have been hounded out by the, uh, uh, by the leaders of the country who want them to be corrupt. Um, what went on? And the postmortems always come down to the same thing. Well, there's no political will for reform at the top in Haiti. And that's accurate, but it's not enough. Unfortunately, that's where the analysis stops, and that's where the analysis should start. Because we know, we know what builds political will. We know what can make social change. There's a blueprint social movement historians have, have uh, studied again and again and found the blueprint for social change. It is global grassroots activism from the bottom, from the core of the communities, supported by some elite assistance, whether it's technical assistance, fundraising help, connections to international and national uh, decision makers. That's the blueprint for social change. It's the blueprint for social change from the US civil rights movement. It's the blueprint for social change that was followed by the anti-apartheid movement. It was the blueprint for social change um, followed by the pro-democracy uh, Eastern European movement. We know that's how it works. And the good news I have, I'm, I spent a lot of time talking about bad news about Haiti, and I apologize, that's unfortunately the reality of Haiti. But the good news is this, Haiti has the blueprint. Haiti has the blueprint in, in place. And that's why it's so exciting to spend time researching this and in solidarity with these folks. Um, when I've spent my time in Haiti, I have observed grassroots demonstrations, passionate, informed, active demonstrations by the poor in the streets, uh, demanding justice for cholera victims, demanding that Jean-Claude Duvalier be prosecuted, uh, demanding that um, victims of gender-based violence, which unfortunately was, was rampant after the earthquake, be, be arrested and be prosecuted. And I met with the leaders of these grassroots organizations many times. There's an independent media. There is real activism on the streets. And they have some international and some national partners as well. Their partners on the legal side are the Bureau des Avocats Internationaux and the Institute for Justice and Democracy. I'm going to use the acronyms and rather than butchering the French, uh, BAI and IJDH. The BAI, located in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, is uh, led by the gentleman up here in the right-hand corner, Mario Joseph. Mario Joseph himself was uh, raised and born in really abject poverty in rural Haiti, uh, lived in a home where there was no running water, no electricity, wouldn't have gone to school at all but for a scholarship to a mission school, then wanted to go to law school and taught for a little while to make money, went to law school, had to drop out to make some more money so he'd go back to law school, but finally pu pushed his way through law school and immediately became the top human rights lawyer in all of Haiti. And he is the lawyer for Marguerite and the 300,000 people who are homeless. He is the lawyer for St. Clair Vincent and the thousands of people affected by cholera. He's the lawyer for Murta Jean Baptiste and the other victims of Jean-Claude Duvalier's brutality. He is the lawyer for the poor. He is an amazing speaker. I hope to have him come to Indiana sometime soon. Um, an amazing speaker, uh, an amazing presence, and he is um, known sometimes as the Martin Luther King Jr. of Haiti. And unfortunately, like Dr. King, he shares a characteristic of being in great danger. Uh, he has been in a death threat, he's had death threats. Uh, shots have been fired into the BA offices, into BAI um, vehicles. Um, he's been the subject of an Amnesty International election alert twice, most recently just a few weeks ago. Uh, the danger is so much that his wife and his children have received political asylum and in, in live in the United States now because of the danger. But he won't leave. He won't leave Marguerite behind, he won't leave Murta Jean Baptiste alive. And he has had friends and allies who have been murdered uh, because they don't play around with political opponents in Haiti. His partner on the international side is the gentleman down in the right hand, lower right hand corner, is Brian Kincannon. Brian Kincannon is an American. Brian Kincannon grew up outside of Boston, went to Georgetown Law School, but shortly after went down to Haiti 
uh, taught himself Creole, and side by side for nine years with Mario Joseph tried the most important human rights cases in all of Haiti's history and achieved amazing success. But what Brian Kincannon realized is that to fulfill his role in this blueprint for social change, he needed to go back to the U.S. He founded the organization Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti to provide fundraising help, to provide access to Capitol Hill, where they've got now dozens and dozens of uh, members of Congress who are on the side of uh, the Haitian human rights activists, uh, to, act, uh, to be activists at the international tribunals, uh, to build alliances with law firms and law schools. And I'm proud to say at our own law school and our own health and human rights clinic here um, in the International Human Rights Law Society, led by Tim Weber up in the corner, um, we are partnering with IJDH on a petition a report to the United Nations on human rights uh, abuses in Haiti. That's the kind of partnership you need. That's the recipe for social change, because IJDH uses social media, traditional media, press conferences, hearings, uh, legal petitions, marches, whatever it takes. That's the recipe for social change. That's the blueprint for social change, and Haiti has it. So I'd like to give you one example of how that works in one of the cases, because this case you may not have heard much about, but I think you will. I think this may be one of the most significant human rights cases that we'll ever see in modern history. And that comes out of what happened to St. Clair Vincent and her mother. Remember that her mother was one of 7,400 people who died of cholera and half a million people who were sickened by this disease. And it all came down all of a sudden in October 2010. Haiti had so many problems. Haiti had so many challenges before October of 2010. But cholera wasn't one of them. Cholera did not exist in Haiti for a century before that, until one day all of a sudden people were dying left and right and getting sick left and right. So what happened? To piece back the evidence, the United Nations has a presence in Haiti, uh, a peacekeeping troop, uh, peacekeeper troop presence in Haiti that's a, a controversial presence, uh, depending on what survey you look at, most Haitians would like them not to be there, but, but, but beside that, the United Nations has a presence in Haiti, including troops from Nepal. And I took this photograph of the, what was then, they've since uh, switched the painting on it, and, uh, but the Nepalese battalion in rural Haiti. And I took this photograph about an hour maybe, 45 minutes after I took the photograph of St. Clair Vincent, because this was just a couple kilometers up the river, this river that you see pictured here as well. The Nepalese troops, as it turned out, in October 2010, deployed to Haiti a new group from a part of Nepal that was recently infested with cholera. The, the troops were not tested. The troops who didn't show symptoms weren't tested, I should say, even though cholera can be carried by asymptomatic people. The troops weren't tested. They went to Haiti. Uh, they were put into this base. And as it turns out, this is also a base where the United Nations was engaged in waste disposal practices that are so disgusting I don't want to spend much time on it. But suffice it to say that hundreds of gallons of untreated human race were dumped into this river. And this river went straight to the river Artibonit in Haiti, which is essentially Haiti's Mississippi River. The drinking water for millions of people, the irrigation water for millions of people, the, um, the bathing water for millions of people. And you can see how the infections just went downstream. You can chart it epidemiologically downstream. People got sick and sick and sick, starting with Rivier Canoe and St. Clair Vincent's mother and all the folks in that, in that uh, village. Ultimately, tests showed that the genetic strain of cholera in Haiti, perfect match for the strain in, um, from Nepal. So when the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control studied this, they came to a certain conclusion. When the Harvard Cholera Group studied this, they came to a certain conclusion. When actually investigators asked to look into it by the United Nations, came to a conclusion, the UN is responsible. The United Nations is the responsibility. The United Nations' reckless actions of not testing these folks, of, of disposing of the waste, not disposing of the waste, dumping the waste, caused St. Clair Vincent's mother to die and thousands of others. Two years later, two years and one month later, right, the United Nations still has an accepted responsibility. Mario Joseph, St. Clair Vincent, thousands of other people affected by cholera have filed legal claims, they've conducted demonstrations, they've filed petitions with the United Nations, members of Congress have asked the United Nations to accept responsibility. The UN's response to date has been, well, let's not focus on the blame game. Let's focus on the fix, right? And let's not worry about assigning responsibility. Let's focus on fixing the problem. That's not good enough for Mario Joseph. It's not good enough for the human rights activists of BAI and IJDH and the thousands of people affected. And they're right. 
And they're right for three reasons. The first of all, the reason the United Nations has to accept responsibility is because of what we're here for today. Human rights are supposed to be universal. We're celebrating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? The reality is St. Clair Vincent's mother lost the geographical lottery. What if that had happened here? What if some entity had come to Indianapolis, Indiana, brought in employees from a place they knew were an infectious disease that had a huge outbreak, didn't test them, and then dumped their untreated sewage, untreated sewage into our waterways? And thousands of people were killed and hundreds of thousands of people were sickened. What would happen here? Well, we would have criminal investigations, we'd have civil investigations, we'd have lawsuits, we'd have apologies, we'd have bankruptcies, we'd have everything. So why is it different? Why is it different that St. Clair Vincent's mother died in Rivia Canoe, Haiti, instead of Noblesville, Indiana? It shouldn't be. The second reason is because a fix only happens when someone is assigned responsibility. It's been wonderful for the United Nations to say, let's focus on fixing this. And everyone knows what the fix is. For two years now, everyone knows what the fix is. Before cholera had an outbreak, we knew what the fix is. Haiti does not have a modern wastewater treatment system. Haiti does not have a water and sewage treatment system. That's why cholera went so crazy. That's why cholera went so rampant. And that's the fix. That's the ultimate outcome of any legal claim that any folks want to see, is that that needs to happen. And Everyone's known that. There's been white papers and discussions and hand-wringing, but two years later, has any steps been really taken to do that? No, because that costs money. And that fix is only going to happen when someone's assigned responsibility. The good news, if there's any good news to come out of this, the good news is the entity who's responsible, the United Nations, actually has the resources and has connections to the resources to actually fix this problem in Haiti. The third reason why Mario Joseph and his clients are right is because the UN needs to set an example for the rest of the world. <laughs> I imagine in this group, folks who showed up for an International Human Rights Law Day celebration, the last thing we want to do is start talking about bashing the United Nations, right? The United Nations is our hope. The United Nations is our hope for justice and for peace and for harmony around the world. And the United Nations, in the terms of the rule of law, as the United Nations goes around and rightly wags its finger in the face of folks in power and says, you must respect human rights. I don't care if you're a dictator in Serbia. I don't care if you're a dictator in Iraq or, or Libya. You must respect human rights. Well, the United Nations now has an opportunity to practice what it preaches. And you can turn this tragedy into an opportunity to prove what we need to prove in 2012, which is that human rights on paper mean human rights in reality for the poorest of the poor. The United Nations can do that by saying, you know what, we were wrong. We were negligent, we were reckless, we were wrong. We're gonna make this right or as best as we can to make it right. The United Nations has the opportunity to set an example for the world. So we do want to leave some time for questions and for comments. So let me wrap it up this way. Um, I appreciate you all coming out to listen to talk about, uh, to listen to a talk about the, the problems in Haiti. I really appreciate your, you listening to ideas for solutions for Haiti and these amazing human rights heroes um, who are fighting for justice in Haiti. Um, I appreciate your kind attention but on International Human Rights Day 2012, I'd like to ask for something more. Because I think today we have a chance to answer that question I started out the talk with. What would you do if you were presented with an opportunity to be a part of human rights history? Because we have an opportunity now to address the challenge. The challenge of international human rights right now is to make these laws on paper a reality for the poorest of the poor. You can do something as simple as, here's the website for Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti. It's HaitiJustice.org, or as you can see, IJDH.org. And it's as simple as going on the right-hand side, like every not-for-profit, you know, they've got buttons here, and you can donate. You can learn more information. You can take action, start getting alerts, find out what you can do. It doesn't matter which of those buttons you push, but once you push one of those buttons, you start the process. It's not the end, by any means but it starts the process of building the foundation of justice, building the foundation of human rights that Haiti so desperately needs. And if you do that, I think we start being able to answer that question. What would you do if it was 1934 and Mohandas Gandhi asked you for help? What would you do if it was 1954 and Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King asked you for help? What would you do if it was 1984 and Nelson Mandela asked you for help? You had a chance to be a part of human rights history. And I can tell you that right now, Marguerite is not an abstraction. This is a real person. This is a real child, as are the 300,000 people who are still homeless. They are with us now. They're struggling for their rights. 
and they need our help. Um, Berta Jean-Baptiste and the thousands of others who were abused by Jean-Claude Duvalier and the millions of other Haitians who are looking for some example to show that justice for all really does imply it in Haiti, that there's no longer impunity for the powerful and the wealthy in Haiti, that the rule of law applies, that human rights applies even for the victims of this dictator. They are with us now, they're struggling for their rights, and they need our help. St. Clair Vincent and the thousands of others who've been affected by the cholera outbreak are still grieving, and they're also still vulnerable because Haiti still has a 19th century water treatment, uh, water system and sewage system that exposes them to cholera, which is now endemic in Haiti. So they're with us now, they're struggling for their rights, and they need our help. So the question we have to answer on International Human Rights Day 2012 is, how are we going to respond? Thank you very much. We have some time for questions and comments, and, uh, and I know there's folks in, uh, in the room who are very interested in Haiti and some folks who have a lot of, of expertise about Haiti and human rights, and so um, I welcome uh, questions, comments, thoughts. Who's going to plunge in first? I think you'd agree those are two very related issues, right? And, and some people talk about as, as Haiti's original sin, and Haiti's original sin is that Haiti is a country founded as a result of the only country in history founded as a result of a successful slave rebellion, right? And when Haiti was created um, as a nation, for over half a century, the United States didn't acknowledge Haiti's existence. And France, as you talk about the structural debt, France had the nerve to actually demand reparations uh, for its property that was taken in the slave rebellion in the terms of I can't remember what the individual dollar figure started out to be but eventually ended up being billions of dollars and, and crippled Haiti financially for many generations as you refer to there were many times as, as recently as the in 1970s and beyond where Haiti was spending more money on debt service than it was on human services and so people say how come Haiti had this kind of suffering? How come Haiti couldn't pull itself out? Well, Haiti has been unfortunately very poorly treated by the rest of the world. And that does circle back to this question of, of racism, unfortunately. Um, in, in researching the book, you go back to some horrible things said about the people of Haiti when, by the, from the United States, from lawmakers, from uh, media folks. Um, from the 19th century and think, okay, maybe that's what we expected. But then Haiti was occupied for 20 years by the United States Marines in the 21st, or excuse me, the 20th century, and horrible things were said, and the premise was that Haitians, as 
quote unquote savages, this is what leaders of this country said, were unable to govern themselves and unable to uh, run their own affairs and were not to be relied upon. And unfortunately, the, even though the words are a lot more nuanced now, even some of the, the reporting after the earthquake uh, was just absolutely appalling of, of, of incredibly exaggerated and, and frankly mostly untrue dis, um, reports of chaos after the earthquake, of looting, of violence. And in fact what was happening is the Haitians were using their hands and any kind of tools they could get to actually t to save their brothers and sisters from under the rubble and that wasn't being reported. The idea that Haitians were helpless and or thieving was gaining significant purchase and I, th I think this is your point and I think it's fair to say and I think that Paul Farmer or anyone else spending time um, studying Haiti says you can't separate that from the racism involved, uh, that these were folks that were un somehow unable to govern themselves and were brutal and they were um, uh, devil worshiping, um, you know, absolute, you know, what can we do about Haiti? And there's even folks, again, after the earthquake you had major media columnists, um, commentators. Pat Robertson, I won't give him a whole lot of credit here, but Pat Robertson said this was, this was Haiti's uh, payback for its pact with the devil. Um, you know, that's still there. Unfortunately, it's, I think you're exactly right, that's still there. And, and that's all the more reason that we need to, to stand up uh, in solidarity with, as Dean Bravo said, uh, not as, um, as saviors for Haiti, but as partners with, as supporters with, providing that supporting role that a social movement has, because it's going to come from the Haitian people. It's going to come from uh, the streets of Haiti and the leadership of the grassroots of, of Haiti. It's going to be its salvation. What we can help, we can definitely help. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting, it's kind of an interesting legal, it's a very interesting legal question because um, when the United Nations um, put peacekeeping troops in Haiti, it negotiated um, well, something called the Status of Forces Agreement. If you know anything about what the United States does and other countries and the United Nations, when they go into countries, they first negotiate an agreement with the government that basically our troops are not going to be liable for under Haitian law. Um, the United States was one of the reason we don't have um, actual military, U.S. military troops in Iraq because the Iraqi government wouldn't agree to, to a similar continued agreement. Uh, so that existed. Uh, but part of the agreement under the Status of Forces Agreement is the United Nations promised to set up something called a claims, a claims commission so that if someone did have a peacekeeping troop, um, you know, uh, killed some of their livestock or, or caused them to have some kind of financial damage that folks, Haitians, can go ahead and file a claim with that commission doesn't exist. The UN never created it. So the lawyers, you can imagine the conundrum for the lawyers. The lawyers, okay, what do we do here? Because there's kind of this stated immunity, but the UN isn't doing their side of it. So what they've done so far, and you'll appreciate the creativity of this, they've gone to this essentially non-existent claims commission. There's a dusty office somewhere in Port-au-Prince, and sometimes they went to the UN headquarters in New York, and they have dumped 10,000 claims um, I think the number is higher than that now, of folks who were victimized by cholera and say, okay, here we go, we're following your process. And the United Nations has, in response, done nothing. Zero. Two years later, nothing. Um, I think it's fair to say in a public forum, I think you can see where this is going, lawyers and law professors and everyone else who's activists, this is setting, it, uh, this setting this, this, uh, the stage for a lawsuit. Um, it's setting the stage for what will be a massive lawsuit. It may be in the Haitian courts, it may be in the United States courts, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but by following the very rules that are set up by this agreement, and of course those rules that the, the process is not being honored by the United Nations, it makes it much harder for the United Nations to come back and say, hey, we've got this uh, immunity. Um, so the United Nations, I, I can kind of see, frankly, you can see it a little bit from their perspective why they haven't said anything. What can they say? The, the damage is here. 7,400 people dead. Half a million people sick, and what is the dollar figure that you put on that? Um, in Bhopal, I remember the UN CARB, uh, excuse me, the Union Carbide's uh, um, toxic gas leak in, in 1984 in Bhopal, India. Um, they end up paying half a billion dollars in damages for the people who are killed and sickened there. Um, who knows what the number would be? And the UN, of course, is concerned about precedent if they go beyond the status of forces agreement. They've got peacekeeping troops all around the world. And if they are going to be liable, what can they do? So you can see it from the kind of the United Nations, the really narrow lawyer 
advising your client about liability, but what you can't see it on the big picture. You can't see the United Nations, which is supposed to be the world's leading voice for human rights and the rule of law, um, simply saying, you're poor and you're in Haiti and therefore we're not gonna do anything about it. Because if they did that here, you know what if they did that in New York? I mean, would they for two years just ignore it? They never would have gotten away with that. Um, so that's kind of the, the legal picture. And that's why I do think it's gonna be a fascinating um, a case from a really abstract legal version, but of course, the more important uh, piece is the more important perspective is the human perspective. Other questions, comments, Professor Brisbane? Um, Congress, the question I don't know if everybody heard was, does Congress do anything? Have there been hearings? There have been some briefings on Capitol Hill. I don't think there's been a committee hearing. Um, there has. Um, the Congressional Black Caucus has been very, very passionate and supportive of human rights in Haiti and has, um, including our congressman here in central Indianapolis, uh, uh, Congressman Andre Carson has signed a letter to the United Nations asking for uh, the United Nations to take responsibility, to take action to prevent cholera from happening again, to get um, uh, recompense for these families. Um, what I think you know, you can ask as an American citizen, it's why Brian Kincannon went back to the United States to do his activism, right? Is the United States has such an important role in funding the United Nations. The United States has such an important role in supporting Haiti that if the United States, if the Obama administration and, the, and Congress and or Congress really wanted Jean-Claude Duvalier prosecuted, Haiti would prosecute him. If they really wanted the United Nations to take responsibility for the people who are suffering from cholera, it would happen. Um, so. That's a really important part of the activism. As you go on to the IJDH website, you'll see that there's, a, again, some sign-on petitions, et cetera, trying to get more members of Congress to, to, to put that kind of push on. Yeah. Folks. And that is what, you know, that's what the petitions and the, and the letters from Congress have said. I don't know if there's a Facebook campaign, but that's the kind of thing you see the Institute for Justice and Democracy doing. They have engaged in, there's a wonderful film, if you look up Baseball in the Time of Cholera, a terrific film that received awards at the Tribeca Film Festival last year. Um, it's going to be screened in Bloomington in, um, in the spring. Um, been invited to go down for that and it's really very moving and so this is the way you build this movement right you have Facebook petitions you have uh, sign-ons you have uh, social media you have traditional media you have films you have press conferences you have hearings and that's what's being uh, that's what's being conducted and honestly I think this will succeed it's not going to be easy I think it's 1934 1954 1984 we're at a stage where it's going to be hard there's a lot of barriers in the way but I think it's going to succeed because there's that right combination of grassroots support and a lot of international allies. Okay. All right. Um, maybe one more question. Go ahead. Right, um, except for telling people to buy this book when it comes out. <laughs> the, the, and this is getting just beyond the scope of what we can address today, is that um, there's some terrific books out there. There's one now recently called um, Killing with Kindness, um, Haiti and the uh, Republic of NGOs by Mark Scholler, a uh, professor now at Northern Illinois University. Um, he's speaking tonight about his book at IJDH offices in, in Boston. Um, he has a real problem that way, and, and, and we've contributed to it in that, um, Everyone wants to have their own NGO and their own organization, and there are, by some estimates, 10,000 NGOs in Haiti. And it's a, it's a challenge. And after the earthquake, Paul Farmer and Brian Kincannon and, and Haitian leaders it, it took to the airwaves and took to the op-ed pages of the New York Times and said, okay, it's going to be tempting to give the money to the Red Cross. It's going to be tempting to give the money to you know, your local church organization doing great work, and that's wonderful. 
but what needs to happen is the government needs to respond. Here, we don't rely on a charity to pave our roads. We don't rely on um, some church ad hoc system to provide our health care or our water treatment system. These are massive problems that take governments. And so we have to work through the Haitian government. That's a challenge, right? Because the Haitian government has, well, among other things, has a bad reputation for corruption. But after the earthquake, um, 27 of the 28 buildings were collapsed and killing so many people. It's a challenge and it's hard, but that's the message Paul Farmer gives. That's the message Haitian leaders like Mario Joseph give, which is that we have to work through and empower the Haitian government to respond. Um, otherwise, we are just taking Band-Aid pieces here and here and here and not addressing the large, because there's not going to be an NGO that's going to create a water treatment system for Haiti. There's not going to be an NGO that's going to effectively overcome the deforestation problem in Haiti. That's going to take massive government leadership, and the Haitian government needs our support to do that. So as an activist, it's a tough challenge because you want to challenge the government to do the right thing. At the same time, you want to build the government's capacity up to do that right thing. Um, so again, my choice after the earthquake now is, is supporting the activists because the activists are pushing for what I think is the sustainable long-term fix for Haiti. Okay, I think we have refreshments outside, is that right, in the, in the hallway. So thank you all very much, appreciate it.